Um, I just want to start by thanking everyone who was involved in the, the Leverhulme network, including Marco, um, because it's been a brilliant 18-month project, which this is the, the culmination of. Women have certainly come a long way since Linda Nochlin wrote her landmark essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists in 1971? Imagine ourselves, for instance, back in the pre-feminist days when the presence of a successful woman artist or any professional woman whatsoever was truly exceptional. In contrast, today, women are featured broadly in important museum and private collections, are subjects of monographs, are represented in art history textbooks, are highly visible in galleries and the media and on the art scene in general. While these are all optimistic signs and certainly represent a shift in, the bo in a positive direction, I would argue that they are by no means seismic. As she stated, there are no women equivalents for Rembrandt, Delacroix, or Cezanne, Picasso, or Matisse, any more than there are black American equivalents of the same. If the problem lies in our institutions at a systemic, foundational level, then what can we do? How can we change our institutions, and can we? Or to paraphrase Audre Lorde, can the master's tools ever really dismantle the master's house? Um, OK, so our slideshow has started. This will just flip through images that will end in 17 minutes when our talk is supposed to end. When you see a candle that looks like a vulva, that means it's the end. <laughs> we can't compete. We won't compete. We can't keep up. And we won't keep down. Why would we want to be winners in this hierarchical structure? <laughs> and how do we both uh, resist and reconcile our participation in this oppressive system? So we feel we have a right to be unhappy with the way the art world is and to see that discomfort as an actually a positive position in the way that um, Sarah Ahmad, that Helene, uh, Helena was referring to, speaks about the feminist killjoy. We see this discomfort as actually a positive position. We are all aware of the real barriers created by white male centric nepotism. And a great example of that is the Toronto International Film Festival last year published its list of 100 essential filmmakers of which only one woman filmmaker was listed and that was Agnes Varda. FAG is interested in queer curating that is unpredictable, is proposed and presented in non-normative ways, is disorienting and unfamiliar, asks more questions than gives answers, and in the words of Sarah Ahmed, tends towards other queer things. We work with institutions, though, in order to push back against the walls and see how flexible they can be or how flexible we can make them. And so, as we say, we won't keep down. Instead, we will collaborate, we will nurture, we will cultivate, we will feed, and we will enable. Thank you. So I'm going to finish very briefly uh, with my most recent work, Queer Reading Room, which is an expansion of these experiments with the desks that I've mentioned. I'll focus on how bodies might extend in this installation and some of the disorienting encounters that might occur. So in that sense, already being a fem feminist or even female curator is, uh, in a way, a kind of queer place to start with, uh, especially in a kind of very sexist environment where I live. Over the last uh, few years, I've been working with a number of collections and trying to work out how um, queer subject matter can be drawn out or overlaid onto them. I kind of had this hybrid role working as a curator, an artist, and an interventionist. And I was interested in what happens when you take a, a seemingly straight organization, a straight collection, and start viewing it through a queer filter. And the uh, sculpture on the left is by uh, Frederick Lord Leighton of an athlete strangling a python. Um, this was pre-Freud, but... <laughs> when I go to historic houses, I, I always play this game. I, don't, I might be the only one. Um, I like to look for the hidden homos. <laughs> and the bachelor uncles and the spinster aunts who just lived together because it was convenient. <laughs> Collections have many queer stories embedded in them, but they're seldom explored by curators and seldom told to the public. I think there's a million ways that queer themes can be drawn out from really unlikely sources, and it's, it's more a question of willing than not having the material available. I will speak about um, 
politics of memory concerning the Holocaust and homosexual victims um, of um, the Nazi regime. So I think what was very easy uh, for German-speaking people after the war is to remember that there had been people resisting political victims of the war. And then there is, of course, also the memory of Jewish victims of the war. But it took a lot longer to remember that there were other victims, that there were Roma and Sinti victims, that there were um, gays, lesbians, and... Um, a variety of, of victims that were taken to concentration camps, persecuted and murdered. I think this is actually what the best thing is for a temporary monument to create a platform um, where the process of producing memory uh, creates this rift in the, in the present time and becomes presence. I did some participant observation there. What do people actually do with this monument? So a lot of them walk their dogs, or they sleep, or they just pass by, or they run around. Or they actually stop and read what this is about. I suppose if I was to frame one question, if I can be selfish and start, is to what extent do you genuinely think the museum can be an agent of change? The audience says, you know, how come you don't have a, a show, a, a, an LGBT show? Or how come you're showing only white men? Because, because once the audience starts to realize, actually, it's not that hard to actually be inclusive. If something so radical as this exhibition happens in a museum, it cannot go back to the past. Mm -hmm. It is just impossible. The changes are happening very, very quickly. And on the other hand, this kind of big museum exhibitions are part of the changes. I think, to be honest, it's, it, it is impossible for the institution not to change. Uh, but, it, but it's not always going to change in the way one would like. But, you know, the institution will never remain as this static thing. To some extent, Britain is responsible to this disaster, humanitarian disaster, around criminalization of homosexuality in the Commonwealth. And obviously, in these countries, you have many queer artists mm -hmm. who have no platform to have exhibitions. And this is your responsibility as a cultural institution in Britain to really display them properly.